Fountain Springs is one church that meets in multiple locations. I'm Pastor Todd, I'm the East Location Pastor, and I'm standing here at East, that is located in Rapid City across from the fairgrounds. And although we meet in multiple locations, our service elements are the same. So you'll see dynamic worship, and you'll see incredible kids ministry happening. And on top of that, you'll see our heartbeat is the same across all these locations, and that is to show people who Jesus is throughout the Black Hills. But I also wanted to invite you. We'd love for you to come and visit and check out and have the experience of going to the East location. We know that life is better together, and as a church, we value community. It's how we grow, how we learn, and how we serve each other. Community happens during our weekly services and our large gatherings, but it can't stop there. We need to go deeper. It happens in small groups, it happens over coffee, it happens over the phone, it happens with friends and family and neighbors. Not being able to gather at a large scale has been hard for us. There's no question about that. But it's also been teaching us. It's pushing us into connection in other ways and maybe ways we've always needed. We have the opportunity to seize this time, to go deep, and to build connections. You can come out of this stronger and closer than ever before. A perfect way to start is by hosting a watch party. What is a watch party? It's simply a group of friends, family, or neighbors setting a time to get together and engage with church online. Decide on your level of comfort and invite someone in. You can set up a Zoom meeting, a room on Facebook, or a video chat while streaming a service. It's meeting in backyards or parking lots where you can watch on a phone or computer together. It's opening up your living room to worship together and maybe even sharing a meal. It's getting creative and using your imagination and asking, how can I grow? And how can I invite someone to grow with me? Pick up your phone, send a text, knock on a door, and invite some people to watch church with you this weekend. Go to watchparty.fs.church to find out more. You're not alone in this time. We're here to help you on your way. Let's build community, connection, and grow deeper together. Hello, I want to welcome you to our church online. At Fountain Springs, we believe that anyone and everyone matters, and our mission is to show people who Jesus is, wherever they are. We have a community of people that are meeting all over the world, watching exactly the same service at the same time, 
And here's the best part, experiencing God together. So no matter where you are today, no matter what you're walking through in life, hear me, you are not alone. Church is coming to you and we are excited that you have joined us. As you get ready for our online experience, I just wanna walk you through just some quick rundowns of what to expect. So here's what it's gonna start off with. It's gonna be some amazing music. And then you'll get to hear and, and we'll share about what God is doing in the life of our church. And then lastly, you'll hear a message from one of our pastors. Now, throughout this next hour, our hope is that you'll encounter God, experience life change, and find community. You may have some preconceived notions about online church, but church gatherings, no matter where they happen, are still about people. To get the full community experience, be sure to participate in our chat section. This is an opportunity for you to build relationships with people here locally and around the world, and you can share your questions, praises, or if you're willing to be vulnerable, your struggles in life. But thank you so much for joining us today, and we are all better when we live life together. Welcome to a service from Fountain Springs Church. We exist to show people who Jesus is in the Black Hills and around the world. We are so glad you joined us today. In just a few moments, the band will be leading us through song and then we will dive into part three of our series, Under Pressure, Thriving in Babylon. Before we do though, I just wanted to take a moment to remind you that we have online services just for your kids. If you're interested, feel free to go to kids.fs.church or to the kids section of our mobile app. Well, wherever you are, will you please join us as we sing? Welcome to Fountain Springs. We're so excited you're with us today. Would you please stand and sing with us? I've searched the world But it couldn't fill me Man's empty praise And treasures that fade Are never enough then you came along and put me back together and every desire is now satisfied here in your love all right let's sing this together oh there's nothing better than you oh there's nothing Better than you are, there's nothing, nothing is better than you. That's the truth that we sing together. I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. And there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Amen. Oh, Is in the business of changing lives. Let's sing this together. You turn mourning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who cares. You turn mourning to dancing. You give beauty 
for ashes You turn shame into glory You're the only one who can You turn graves into gardens You turn bones into armies You turn seas into highways You're the Nothing is better than you. Let's sing that again. There's nothing. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. You turn. Into gardens, you turn boats into armies, you turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. Yes, it. You turn graves into gardens, you turn boats into armies. You turn seas into highways You're the only one who can You're the only one who can You're the only one who can Amen I see. 
Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Yes, He is. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. So about a year and a half, two years ago, I signed up for this workout app online. And it's actually, it was really great. I liked it a lot. Uh, what I liked most was the trainers. They weren't like in your face or yelling at you or telling you how pathetic you were. Uh, instead, they were encouraging and positive. And I ended up following a bunch of them on Instagram, that kind of stuff. I got in some Facebook fitness groups, uh, but as a result, all the algorithms kept pushing me these transformation posts or sign up for this new meal plan that we have or get the five secrets to keto or whatever it is. Uh, what I found though is these are all great ideas and great steps, but they're simply one step in a long process. We know that taking that one step won't solve or get you to your, de to your destination. Instead, it takes dedication day after day of being committed, getting up each morning and doing that exercise, or each meal choosing to be healthy. Are there any gardeners out there? I'm not a gardener, but I love the idea of having fresh vegetables in my backyard. I love garden tomatoes. By comparison, a grocery store tomato is like eating a red ball of garbage but a garden tomato is just so good. The reason I don't garden is because I can't just throw some seed in my backyard and then come fall, harvest these vegetables. If you're someone who does garden, you know it takes daily attention, day after day of watering, of tending the soil, of pulling weeds. It's an ongoing commitment. In our Bibles, in the book of John, there's this kind of funny moment uh, where the woman who had followed Jesus, Mary, is at his tomb after he'd been buried. And it says this, At this she turned and saw Jesus standing there, but she, did, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you put him and I'll get him. She mistakes Jesus for the gardener. And some would say that it wasn't actually a mistake, but the author is trying to make a point. See, throughout our Bibles, there's a theme of planting, of growth, and of gardening. Jesus isn't that trainer yelling in your face, telling you you're pathetic, 
uh, just being mean to you, he's a lot more like a gardener. And what he's saying is he's inviting you, putting his hand out each day and saying, today, will you work in the garden with me? And pull those weeds in your life, plant those seeds in your life. He's offering you an invitation. There are a ton of ways uh, you can do that or that might look differently for you. Uh, For me, that invitation means I listen to a ton of podcasts to try and grow and learn more. One thing I'm doing right now is trying to listen to as much or read as much of the Bible as I can this year. So that means each day trying to read, trying to listen, because the Bible is a huge book. And I can't plant and harvest that task in one day at the end of the year. It's taking these longings that we have and turning them in to a lifestyle. What is it for you that's in your life that God could be calling you and asking you uh, to work in the garden with today? Maybe it's reading more of your Bible. Maybe it's praying consistently or giving consistently. Maybe it means getting into community for you. Our groups are kicking off and sign up start this week. So if that means that's a step for you, go to our app or website and sign up for a group. Whatever it is, I believe God wants to grow you. So would you accept that invitation today to work in the garden with Jesus every day? Let me pray for us. And as I do, ask God to speak to you what it is he wants from your life. God, Thank you for the chance to to grow and learn from you. The fact that you want to work with us, don't abandon us, but instead want to cultivate a life in us and plant seeds in us that will grow and bear good fruit. Help us to hear you and be obedient to the things you're calling us to so we can become more like you and grow your kingdom here on earth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand with us as we continue to sing? Let's sing this out before I spoke a word. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. Only overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. It chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. When I was your foe, when I was your foe, still your love fought for me. You have been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. been so, so kind to me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it still. Yeah.
no shadow you won't light up mountain you won't climb up coming after me there's no wall you won't kick down lie you won't tear down coming after me there's no shadow you won't light up mountain you won't climb up coming after me there's no wall you won't kick down lie you won't tear down coming after me there's no shadow you won't light up mountain you won't climb up coming after me there's no wall you won't kick down lie you won't tear down coming after me There's a place for me I'm 
And may we remember that truth always. Thank you guys so much for singing with us. Thank you for being with us so far. At this time, we'd love for you to worship with us through giving. Jesus is calling us to live a life of abundance, not scarcity. I know there are times in life where our tendency is to hold on to what we have, especially when times are tough. It's in these times we get to decide who we're actually going to be. Will we become people who are more generous or something else? Would you join me in living the life Jesus has for us by practicing generosity? To give today, simply go to give.fs.church. At the top of the page, just click the Give button or scroll down and see a list of easy ways to give. By giving, you make a difference in your own life and the lives of so many around you. Well, hello everyone online, on TV, however you're watching this, I've got folks with me. We're going to go, in fact, right to the point. In fact, I've got to set the stage for this entire sermon, so I don't know if this is smart, but I'm going to tell you what the whole thing's about at the beginning. Please pay attention to the rest of it. But here's, here's the first part. Crucial conversation. Okay, just, so if you take notes, I just gave you a lead-in that says, take a note. So that's just how this works. So Crucial conversation here. This is the definition, by the way. A discussion between two or more people where the stakes are high, opinions vary, and e <laughs> some of you are nervous now. This is going to be good. <laughs> and emotions run strong. Now, to help everyone sit at ease, I am not going to have a crucial conversation with you. <laughs> Some of you are like, is that how you set up all your sermons? Like, no. Uh, actually, I think, I think crucial conversations stir up a pressure in us that for many of us, it's got us consumed. So I want you thinking about that definition of crucial conversations, how you do with that, how you like them, how you hate them, how you, whatever you think about them, that's the stage for where I want to take you in the Bible. Now, let me take you into the Bible. We've been studying a guy by the name of Daniel. Uh, it's a, he's, his story is put into the Old Testament. Uh, but, but he's a guy who got uh, taken from his country, his homeland. Uh, he was taken and, and put into a, another form of government, new language, new everything. And he began to work for a guy named King Nebuchadnezzar. Now, here's what happens. Here's, the, here's this story this week. The, the king has a dream. I don't know if you remember your dreams. I, I remember about 5% of them. This dream was unique and got put into the Bible. So King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream about a tree. A tree. It's about a tree. If you want to read about this dream about a tree, it's in, it's in Daniel chapter 4. And, and it'll tell you, 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 you can nerd out on, on all of it. So the king calls in all of his I just want to use the word weirdos, but he calls in these people who, who like do a bunch of weird stuff. It's all pretend like song and dance kind of stuff to like tell him what the dream meant. It bothered him so much. He remembered the dream so much. He's like, I got to know what this dream means. So he calls these people in. None of them can tell them about this tree dream. They're like, we don't get it, man. Like weirdness out, king. We don't, I have no idea what to tell you. So the king, almost last resort, talks to Daniel. And he goes to Daniel and says, Daniel, here's the dream. What's it mean? Now I'll take you in. 
Belteshazzar, that's Daniel, by the way. If you haven't read the book, you're like, I thought we were talking Daniel. That's, that's the king's name for Daniel. Uh, that was the dream that I, King Nebuchadnezzar, had. Now tell me what it means for none of the wise men of my kingdom. I would use that uh, cautiously, but anyways, none of the wise men of my king, kingdom can do so, but you can tell me because the spirit of the holy gods is in you. Now, this is important. If you have ever felt like you're not quite sure how to talk about God, because no one's ever really talked to you about God, you see this in the king, how he's articulating, hey, you've got like this spirit that talks to you, this God, I, would he help with this dream? And And so the king is now saying, I got this dream. Daniel, you got like this God guy that tells you stuff. Um, Tell me the dream. What's it mean? What's it mean? And if you've never read the dream and you don't know what happens, let me show you Daniel's response. Upon hearing this, Daniel, also known as Belteshazzar, was overcome for a time, frightened by the meaning of the dream. So a lot happens in a short amount of time in the, in, in the Bible here. But basically, he's asked to tell the king the meaning of the tree dream. It sounds like I'm telling you about a movie. Oh, I'm not, okay. So this is real. Apparently, God tells Daniel very quickly what the dream means. And Daniel, all of a sudden, finds himself crazy alarmed. Because if you'll notice, it says, um, overcome for a time. That's a horrible English translation. I mean, it's, it's like very prim and proper. He was overcome for a time. <laughs> if you get into the actual original words, and you're like, what did they use those words for? He was struck, shocked, like literally going, oh, and for a time, they even, some say for a whole hour. He was astonished is another word. The king says, here's the dream. Apparently, God downloads the meaning, and Daniel is in front of the king, supposed to tell him, and it finds himself going, I don't want to tell you. Because here, I'll sum up the dream. here. The dream was God confronting the king. The tree dream was God talking to King Nebuchadnezzar through a story. And saying, I am confronting you. I'm not going to make you raise your hands or anyone volunteer say, who loves to confront people? Uh, Most of us do not love this. Most of us find a a building pressure about it that uh, begins to do stuff to us. And that's why I tried to get you to take a note at the very beginning of the sermon where I showed you the definition of crucial conversations because it's when two people are having a conversation and there's an intensity to it, so much so it can dominate your thoughts. You ever been there? I have. Where you're like, "I, I need to talk to them about and you begin to get consumed by that? Some of you, I can sense the tension and the nervousness. Because we're, well, there's, there's, I'm going to tell you reasons, but what plays out is you begin to witness Daniel internally, like, losing it. Now, what's cool is he doesn't lose it on the outside. But internally, let's watch this because it's a blast. Uh, then the king said to him, because... And by the way, the king's going to say, let me help, Belteshazzar, don't be alarmed by the dream and what it means. The only reason the king is giving this, like, hey, hey, don't don't be freaked out, is because Daniel appears to be freaked out. You don't just be like, hey. I mean, the king doesn't know what this is about. That's why he's asking for help. So he goes... He apparently, Daniel spending an hour or however long this played out, his astonishment, his like, oh my goodness, is like showing everywhere. And the king's like, hey man, don't worry about it. Huh, watch this. Belteshazzar replied, I wish the events foreshadowed in the dream, in this dream, would happen to your enemies, my Lord, and not to you. Woo. <laughs> I wish they would happen. To, to your enemies, which tells us evidence that this interpretation of this dream is going to be one of the most difficult conversations that Daniel has to have. What I just want you to see, just for a second, is that the Bible relates to you. That when you, when you read the Bible, and you, you see like old stuff, it seems so ancient, and 
No. I think all of us probably right now can think of stuff that we're like, I need to say that, and I don't know if I want to say it. So uh, let's watch this play out because it's, oh, it's fun. Here's the meaning of it. Uh, so king, uh, you'll be driven from human society and you will live in the fields with the wild animals. You will eat grass like a cow and you will be drenched with the dew of heaven. Yay! Uh, seven periods of time will pass while you live this way and until you learn uh, that the most high rules over the kingdoms of the world and gives them to anyone he chooses, uh, but the stump and roots of the tree were left in the ground. This means that you will receive your kingdom back again when you have learned that heaven rules. Would you like to have that conversation with a king? Who, by the way, if you haven't been a part of this series, who has a tendency to have a bit of an anger issue who likes to throw people in a furnace and just do some crazy stuff. Would you like to tell a king? See, many of us are like, I would have done it, but many times we won't say something to our spouse that we need to bring up or a friend that we need. In fact, here, I, I didn't do any scientific data. I just know this is true. 99% of us delay crucial conversations. If I had to guess right now, you've got one you're delaying. I would bet right now that you could think of like, you know it needs to be addressed. It may not be like catastrophic stuff, but it needs to be brought up, but you are delaying it for some reason, and it's got you kind of worked up any time you revisit the need to bring it up. And Daniel's got a lesson for us. Uh, here's reasons why maybe this will resonate with some of us. Uh, we don't like rejection. I mean, I've never met a person who's like, you know, I just am in the mood to be rejected today. Right, and if you're going to have a if you're going to have a crucial conversation with someone, if it's that kind of conversation, there's a tendency to feel like if I say this to them, especially in today's society, they may reject me, and it's all over if I actually say this. We don't like hurting someone. I actually think uh, that the majority of us do not enjoy saying something to someone and like really ripping them apart. I know sometimes we, we brag that we do and we pretend that we do and some of us even do this, but I think internally that we don't like hurting people. And so you have a crucial conversation. Oftentimes someone feels hurt and we just don't enjoy that. Uh, we don't want to start a, a bigger problem. Amen? Any, it, maybe your crucial conversation involves family. Come on. And you're like, you know what? We're kind of okay now. It's kind of semi-decent. I don't want to create another problem where I'm the bad child or the bad this or the rejected that or cut off that. And so sometimes we don't have the crucial conversation because we're afraid of well, what could play out. Actually, I just wanted to add, um, we don't know how. And uh, many of us right now, please don't do this. Uh, you can witness this all over social media, in the news, uh, this, this inability to even have a crucial conversation with people. We're like, we struggle with it, don't we? Like, some of the pressure that you've got built into you is like, it wasn't modeled to you. Uh, you didn't grow up around this, or it was exampled in ways that were bad. And, and so here's what we're doing. Seth Godin says this. He's an author. Uh, Short-term pain has more impact on, on most people than, than long-term benefits do. I mean, this, we, we know this with a lot of different areas of, of life, but, but the short-term pain, many of us are saying, you know what, that is such a big deal right now that I'm just not going to bring it up. I'm not going to even address this. The short-term pain of it. So I thought I'd tell you some stories on me because you might be thinking about yourself, and I thought, well, let me help resolve some of the tension as we go through this. Uh, I struggled with crucial conversations, especially in high school and college. Uh, one, I'll give you an example of, it wasn't really modeled to me all that well. I grew up in a great family. My mom and dad, I love them very much. Uh, they are amazing parents. But all of us know that other people influence us other than just our parents. Well, I played sports too. Specifically, I, I played sports in, in, in Indiana. And this is important because I played basketball in Indiana. If you don't know anything about Indiana and you've never seen the movie Hoosiers, which might be dating me, but uh, in, in Indiana, if you don't play basketball, you don't belong. It's, they will try to just get you to move. That's how that works. Uh, if you drive, and test me on this, at least when I grew up in Indiana, you can drive through any neighborhood, any time, and there were basketball goals at everyone's driveway. 
That's just, we grew up, basketball was king. The problem with it was, when I was doing all this, at the same time at the University of Indiana was a guy named Bobby Knight. Bobby Knight was their basketball coach, and he was ruthless. In fact, if you'd like to Google this, just go to YouTube, and you'll see there's a moment he's notorious for where he's mad, so he picks up one of the chairs and throws it across the basketball court to make a point. So I tell you that because many of the high school coaches thought he was worth mimicking. It was splendid. So regularly in basketball, just so because they thought this was good coaching, was they thought that the motivation you needed, like most of all, was to be literally be screamed at as loud. I, I don't think any of my basketball coaches had an inside voice. Do you guys know what inside voices are? I don't think they had those. They didn't even work. And I'll never forget one moment in particular, because if you ever messed up, if, if you ever like, legitimately didn't do the right thing, the coach didn't come over and say, like, hey, man, David, uh, can, next time I, I need to go around that screen. Uh, no, it was a lot of words I'm not going to say right now. Um, in addition to my name and sometimes family members being brought up and eventually, hey, next time go around the screen. Uh, one time I, I, I messed up. I, I, I threw the ball away accidentally, so I went to go get the ball. So I'm running after the ball. I jump after the ball, grab the ball, and throw it in. But as I'm falling, I, I step in a wrong way anyways. I end up tearing about everything I can tear in my ankle. What I remember is actually not the pain of that. What I remember is looking up at my coach, who is now screaming at this is practice, screaming at me, telling me how horrible I am to where just if you want to more middle picture, my middle school basketball coach, who knows where he came from, had to get in, in, in between us because I was being screamed at. I now can't walk. And I'm thinking, you know what? Um, I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> That's one example of a crucial conversation gone wrong, right? You might have your own examples. Well, here's my problem. All in that, I started dating. And my problem was that because I didn't like some of the models of how to talk to people and how it made me feel, I thought dating would be like, hey, let's just not bring up the difficult stuff. So I was going to graduate my senior year, and I was dating a girl, and, and it, was, it was very clear to, to me, at least, uh, we were not a, a going to get married couple. I don't know if anyone resonates with this. I just kind of knew that at the time. Uh, and it was like, hey, you know... I, I need to break this off, uh, but I knew that I would hurt her. I knew that it would break her heart. So I'm like, I don't know what to do because I don't want to be dating her. But if I stop it, she's going to be mad. Now, I know some of you who are really good at these crucial conversations are like, no, you just break up. Well, in my heart, I was like, well, what, what will she do if we break up? And no joke, one of her family members at one time said to me, and I still can remember, it's like, yeah, David, I don't know what she would do if you guys ever broke up. So that like locked in. I was like, we'll never break up. I don't want to date her, but we're not going to break up. So eventually, so eventually I, uh, I decide I'm going to break up. And I don't know how it played out, but I, I, I got enough courage to, to break up. And you might, yeah, I'm so proud of you, David. Uh, actually, a couple months later, um, I saw her, and we started dating again. Uh, and we dated for way too long. Um, the sad thing about this, honestly, the sad thing about this, is it almost wrecked my relationship with Katie, my wife now. Because what I did is I took that, took all those experiences of crucial conversations, how to speak truth in a relationship, the right way and the wrong way and all that kind of stuff. I brought it into my relationship with Katie and basically frustrated her like crazy. And we spent basically our first year of marriage deprogramming me to where I had to learn like how to, sounds weird, say how I feel, talk about it without fear of how it's going to play out. So what I've learned as a recovering person, <laughs> okay, that's why I tell you all this, is, is recovering what I've learned. Uh, let, me, let me share with you what, what I've learned, and we're going to use this, this story of Daniel to walk us through this. Uh, here's, here's what I know. Here's the, about when it comes to truth, some are unwilling to confront, which I, uh, some, some are unwilling to confront, some are unloving when they confront. 
I think my two stories about my experiences actually mimic a lot of culture and probably even resonate with you going, oh, I know someone, or maybe you're one of them, and, and you know someone else, and, and we begin to know this and feel this. And I think if, if we don't wrestle with this, we're going to really destroy some of our relationships. One with God, of course, but with others, and we're going to find ourselves in, unable to have crucial conversations. So uh, Daniel teaches us something that is worth learning here. King Nebuchadnezzar, please accept my advice. Now let me stop. Because some of us are skeptics and we're like, wow. I mean, he was just relaying a message from God. It wasn't really his words. Like always, I mean, the king gave him permission to interpret the dream, right? Well, notice this. Daniel has stopped interpreting the dream as soon as he brings up, I've got advice for you, king. Feel the tension in that. King Nebuchadnezzar, please accept my advice. Stop sinning and do what is right. Break from your wicked past and be merciful to the poor. Perhaps then you will continue to prosper. I love it because if you didn't catch it, inside of that little part of what Daniel decides to do post-interpreting the dream, he gives you and I a gift and says, oh, do you struggle with crucial conversations? Do they build pressure up in your every part of you where it makes you just, and you hate it? Well, Daniel just gave us a gift on how. Just gave us a gift on how. Yeah, let me, let me show you. Crucial conversations. They require, there's, there's a couple of ingredients here. Uh, honest words. That we're going to stay with the unwilling and unloving, but honest words. This is, this is for the person unwilling, literally unwilling to share. And I was told one time that, that one of the greatest forms of kindness in a relationship is to let the truth stay visible is to make sure the truth is always known. It's one of the greatest forms of kindness, but, but if you struggle with this, honest words, if you're like, okay, I gotta have this, then make sure your words are honest and not, listen, not opinion. <laughs> not simply emotions you have felt, but the, 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 the honesty behind it, the, the tender heart. I wish I could plug this into the internet somehow, some sort of tender heart to where this unloving approach to truth, this unloving like, like, oh, I feel this. this, this stirs me up, but a tender heart. I wonder if you are willing to take both and say, I, I want to have both. This is, this is the ingredients. But by the way, I've purposefully, like fully, like intentionally neglected someone in this whole sermon. On purpose, don't worry about it. I've been talking about your difficulty, my difficulty to have a crucial conversation, right? What about the person on the other side? Have you ever been there? If not, you will be. Where the person's been stewing about a conversation they're going to have with you. They're afraid of your reaction and your response. They're concerned with what it's going to do to you and how you're going to feel. Did you know that? I don't mean to break your heart right now. And we need to bring up just a little bit, just a little bit of like, okay, how do I prepare for a crucial conversation that I don't lead? <laughs> Here. If you listen, I underlined some things for us. If you listen to constructive criticism, notice it says constructive, right? You don't need a sermon on that right now, but it doesn't say criticism. It says constructive criticism. There's plenty of criticism, but listen to constructive criticism. You will be at home among the wise. If you reject discipline, you only harm yourself. But if you listen, there it is again. If you listen to correction, you grow in understanding Fear of the Lord teaches wisdom. Humility precedes honor. Such good wisdom here on if, if you're not ready to listen, you need to get ready to listen. So it's not just about how do I tell them what I've been wanting to tell them. Are you mature enough to listen? Are you mature enough really to actually take it in to maybe God has something to share with you? If you are, we can now combine all the groups in this, and I'll show you here's an approach. This is worth taking notes on. This is good wisdom straight from Daniel and scripture all over. This is great. Approach. What will I say? How will I say it? Why am I saying it? You should have this either written out or planned before you ever go into a crucial conversation. What will I say? Like, am I going to call them names? I probably shouldn't. If I'm being criticized... What will I say? 
How will I say it? Tone matters. Ask any married couple you ever meet. Tone matters. And then one of the biggest ones, why am I saying it? Why? Let me answer the why for you, okay? I think Daniel would tell us. I think Daniel would actually say, you want to know why you should have a crucial conversation? Why was Daniel willing to talk to a king and say what he said? Why was Daniel willing to give advice to a king? Here. The heart of confrontation should be restoration. Always. Always, always, always. In fact, uh, let me take you to Galatians because Galatians is, this is one of my favorite parts. This is talking about specifically for Christians, but dear brothers and sisters, if, if another believer is overcome by some sin, basically if someone screws up, you who are godly, I guess if you aren't, you won't do this, should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. And be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's burdens and in this way obey the law of Christ. If you think you are too important to help someone, by the way, uh, you are only fooling yourself. And then some of our favorite parts of the whole Bible, you are not that important. Uh, if you were to study this more, you would learn this whole, uh, like, gently and humbly help that person get back into the right path. Uh, the original language talks more about how, how to mend their net, how to actually get them back to the person that God created them to be. If you want to know why you should have a crucial conversation, why you should listen, why your heart should be tender yet bringing truth there is so that restoration actually occurs. If you ever find yourself as a boss having a difficult conversation with an employee, restoration should be the agenda. They don't have to stay employed there, but restoration, who that person can be, should be on the table. If you ever have this as a married couple, it should not be to split you guys up. It should be that restoration occur. Restoration should be the agenda, restoring, getting it back to the way it should be. So let me finish with this. Uh, you might be wondering, like, what's the weird urn? Is that an urn, David? Uh, no, no, actually, it's a pot. Um, Katie and I traveled to Colorado a while back, um, actually on a, on a marriage retreat, and we learned about this kind of pottery called uh, Raku pottery. There's different versions of it. The Western one um, basically looks like this. You take a pot like this and you stick it into a kiln, a fire. Uh, you get it to this stage where, I know we talk about the words red hot often, but literally you get it red hot. You get it as hot as possible. You, you like, you, I mean, you, you get it burning hot. Then you immediately take it out as fast as you can. You, this, the next process, you, and then you throw it into, you don't throw it, you set it. You set it in trash is the best word to tell you. Literally trash. The best, the best ones come out, the better your trash is. If you want to know, like, I'll give you a full description, like manure, um, old newspapers, uh, just garbage upon garbage that you can get, and you, you stick this in there, and what, you, what you'll come out with is this, and you'll notice that this has just a lot of different colors, and this is what happens to it. This, what I would consider, this beautiful pot that has colors that can't be duplicated in any way, requires trash. That's why I got it. I love this kind of stuff. See, sometimes we think that trash is a waste. <laughs> uh, a lot of times we think, we think that trash, the bad things that happen, especially in relationships, mean that, that what happened has ruined it. I wonder if you've been there. Maybe, maybe you've experienced a ruined relationship. I wonder, I, I wonder this. If you and I got better at crucial conversations, better at listening, but also better about being tenderhearted and actually speaking the truth, what if we could produce more relationships like this? More people like this? If we didn't just say, well, it screwed up, so it's over. Doesn't that sound like a better world? It sounds like, well, like what Jesus has called us to do. However, many of us are taking the season that we're in, and we're, we're, we're oh, oh, you're loving a part of the sermon here, the truth part. 
But many of us are just casting out truth at people with no intentions of turning anything into any healthy kind of relationship. I think this story about Daniel is for you and I going, okay, there's some stuff I got to bring up, but how do I bring it up? This is one of those sermons. It's not an inspirational. It's to equip you. So here's what I pray. That crucial conversation that we started off at the very beginning that you probably now have on your heart. You know that person. You know what you got to bring it up. You got Hopefully now you know exactly how to do it. Thanks to Daniel and God and the Holy Spirit saying, here's how to do this. Let me pray for us because we'll need it. Heavenly Father, Lord, I would, I, if there's stuff, Lord, that we're delaying that we shouldn't delay, Lord, would you prompt us even now in this moment to, uh, to get on what you want us to do? Lord, if there's stuff we need to address, Lord, would you just put it on our hearts and even prepare the heart of the person or the people that we need to talk to. Lord, if, we, if we've not been listening, Lord, would you soften our hearts and prepare us to hear information, to hear things that will be difficult but necessary. Lord, would you take, a, I think, a somewhat tense, difficult lesson here from Daniel, and would you do a work in our very hearts so that we can honor you with how we live our lives? We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you have an idea in your mind of what the conversation is for you, I just challenge you, along with David, to make that happen this week. Maybe tell someone you trust, like a friend or a spouse, and say, there's a conversation I need to have. Would you make sure that I have it this week? Ask me if I had it. And hopefully that'll help you push you to actually do it. Uh, a couple of things before we go. Uh, if you have our mobile app, this is way easier. But if you haven't signed up for our men's retreat and you want to come, I don't know what's stopping you, so just sign up for that. And then our groups, our fall semester of groups, is sign up, start today, and go for the next few weeks. But again, don't wait. Uh, just check out, uh, check out, uh, check out uh, our groups on our app or our website. They're a great way for you to get plugged in, connected, and uh, hopefully grow in your faith and life with Jesus and in community with others. Uh, that's all for this week. We're so glad that you joined us, and we'll see you next week. Digital and consistent giving has never been easier. It's as easy as sending a text from your phone. Simply pull out your phone and text the word GIVE to 605-299-8374. It's as simple as that. Thanks for helping us make a lasting impact in the Black Hills. Here at Fountain Springs, we believe in the next generation. We want you to know that we've made it easy for your kids to engage in a service that meets them at their level. There are three easy steps to take to access these services. Step one, download our app. Launch your preferred app store and search for Fountain Springs Church. Step two, once you find it, download and open the app. Step three, on the front page, you will see an icon titled Kids Services. Just touch that image and pick the service for your appropriate age group. We have a service designed for preschool kids and a service designed for elementary kids. It's as easy as that. We hope your kids enjoy.